Attorney General Robert Kennedy spoke uh, to the New England Law Institute about the impact of Gideon v. Wainwright, and this is what he said. If an obscure Florida convict named Clarence Earl Gideon had not sat down in jail with a pencil and paper to write a letter to the Supreme Court, and if the Supreme Court had not taken the trouble to look for merit in that one crude petition among all the bundles of mail it must receive every day, the vast machinery of American law would have gone on functioning undisturbed. But Gideon did write that letter, and the whole course of American legal history has been changed because of this ruling, this case, and Gideon taking up that pencil is why we have public defenders available. Clarence Gideon was an interesting man. He was a semi-literate drifter. He uh, was definitely familiar with the law. He had gotten into trouble, in and out of trouble, most of his life. Um, he his early history was he ran away from home around eighth grade so he's educated to the eighth grade um, he ended up spending three years in juvenile institution and after that he was one of those guys who he would always seem to be in the wrong place at the wrong time it was June 3rd 1961 and um, the Bay Harbor pool hall had been broken into Gideon was supposedly there. Eyewitnesses claimed that they had seen him leave from the back alley. Uh, when police investigated, they found that it had the, the window had been broken. Um, inside, someone had broken into the vending machines, um, taken wine, cigarettes, um, some coke, and approximately $65 in change from the vending machine. As I said, Gideon was a shady character. By that time, he was approximately 51 years old, and he pretty much lived by running card games, so gambling. He was a gambler. Um, they found him at a different bar, and he had about $25 plus, like in some sense, but most of it was in coins, and they just assumed, knowing him, his past record. They arrested him for this larceny and the breaking and entering. What's interesting and what struck me about the case was that he, it would have been a misdemeanor, but that breaking in made it a felony. Um, in August, early August is when his case was actually tried, um, and he asked the judge for lawyer because he was a drifter, had no money, couldn't afford an attorney, and they denied it, saying that in the state of Florida, they only provided legal counsel when it was a capital case, meaning rape, murder, that the defendant, if convicted, would go to prison for life or face a death sentence. So, but it was that key element of the breaking in that made it the felony. He wasn't given any time to prepare. He had to wing it right there in court. Um, and of course, the eyewitness, there were two eyewitnesses that showed him near the scene. And so um, he was found guilty by a jury. The judge sentenced him to five years after reviewing his criminal history. So he was adamant that the Sixth Amendment guarantees us right to counsel. Um, the way that that had been interpreted up until this time was that you have the right to hire an attorney if you choose. That yes, you can have an attorney, you hire one. Um, at that time, most of the states, a capital offense, automatic. If you couldn't afford an attorney, couldn't hire one yourself, one would be provided. So at this point, um, Florida was among 13 states that interpreted the law the way that they did, saying it's only for a capital crime. Um, at, but Gideon felt that the 14th Amendment is our due process amendment, um, our rights for due process, I mean, and um, he was adamant that his due process had been violated by the denial of an attorney when he requested one. So that's what he stuck onto. That was in his head. He was a stubborn man 
But again, that perseverance um, is what led to these events that unfolded. So when he uh, was sent to Rayford Prison, he immediately found the library at the jail and he started studying. Um, according to um, Anthony Lewis, who wrote Gideon's Trumpet, um, which became the movie, the Hallmark movie in 1980, um, Gideon admitted to not really understanding a lot of what he read and um, one of the documents that I used in research was his actual, um, his, uh, the documents that he sent, the letter that he wrote to the Supreme Court asking for the case to be uh, reviewed. Um, he, you could tell that he was studying other court cases and trying to model them. He was actually submitted a writ of um, certio rari, um, but he felt that that means that the court's going to review it. If they look at it, um, they're going to say, okay, we're going to review this case. He didn't even understand, Gideon didn't understand that what he was asking. He was using this term, but really what he thought is that they were going to say, you get to be released from prison because you were denied your due process. Um, so when that actually happened, when the Supreme Court said, yes, we will review the case, Gideon was upset because he assumed he was gonna walk out of the jail. Abe Fortas um, argued before the Supreme Court um, in defense of Gideon. And the questions that the court was asking were, can a layman defend himself before or against a trained lawyer. And that was Fortas's defense, is that really we can't. Um, and so that's how the tables turned. Uh, Bruce Jacob, what, he worked for the uh, Attorney General for State of Florida. He was sent to Washington, D.C. to um, argue for the State of Florida. Um, he had petitioned all of the states to say, look, if this ruling takes place, the state of Florida had roughly about 5,000 um, inmates that might be affected that uh, essentially had to defend themselves. So what the state of Florida was looking at was what impact was this going to have on the state and every state. So. Um, Bruce Jacob wrote to all of the other states. He was really looking for support, um, saying, I don't know, this is how it's going to impact Florida. This could happen, so let's band together. Well, what happened instead was 23 of the states banded together, but in support of Gideon. So it wasn't just the Supreme Court that was realizing that we need clarification on this law. It was these other states as well. Um, so again, Gideon was disappointed. He thought he was going to walk out the door. And then when the Supreme Court made the determination that Gideon needed to have a second trial, and this time with an appointed attorney, he needed a trained defender. Um, again, Gideon was upset. He thought, "That's I don't want another trial. He then felt that his um, Fifth Amendment was being violated because now he was being tried for the same crime. So he thought it was double jeopardy. So it's a perfect example of um, it's irony here because Gideon didn't truly understand the law, but he had such intense belief on our Constitution to protect its citizens. Um, and that's what I find so fascinating about this entire case and the, all the steps that um, take place. Um, so uh, Abe Fortas had actually written to two lawyers that he knew and asked if they would defend Gideon in the second trial. And they agreed, but Gideon, they didn't really connect somehow. He, did, he was bitter. He really felt that he should not have a second trial. So he ended up, he actually told the lawyer, or the judge, told the judge that he wanted to defend himself again. 
same lawyer and of course that, I mean, same judge, Judge McCrary, who was not gonna let that happen. We're not gonna do this two times. Um, so they ended up finding a lawyer that Gideon did feel comfortable with and he still was bitter and still grumbled that, you know, again, he was, it wasn't what the Constitution said. His rights were being trampled on, um, but in the end, he was acquitted. Just about every person alive has seen any kind of show on TV. They know that, hey, Miranda rights aren't read, um, your due process may have been violated, the case could get thrown out. We see this all the time on TV, and of course, TV is oversimplifying everything. Um, but Miranda was basically, you're allowed counsel when you request it during questioning. So it expanded it. And that's the other thing that's important about this book and something that was reiterated for me and I try to share when I go to schools and talk about the books um, or this case or anything, um, understanding how our Constitution is organic and it's the job of the Supreme Court to constantly be reviewing and interpreting how it's interpreted by the country and every state. And that's, again, something that Gideon was not aware of. Um, I think most people are not aware of that. And it's important to understand that's why there's new cases and little adjustments made and expanding this right, clarifying how it's interpreted. And if we understand that, I think we're less likely to take things for granted. I mean, we know that we have constitutional rights. That's what Gideon stuck on. I have the right to an attorney, I have the right to due process, and I have the right not to be tried for the same crime twice. Well, he really didn't understand those rights, but it got the gears rolling to what we all um, benefit from today.